各位在座的老师、各位同学，大家午安，大家下午好。啊，非常，我是李念祖，啊，我在呃，李律法律事务所服务，我也是呃，中华民国国际法学会的常务理事，呃，同时也是宪法学会的秘书长。呃，今天非常高兴有机会能够来到正大，呃，来主持这一场呃非常难得的演讲会。那同样或者是更难得的，呃，这场演讲会我们请到了马前总统来为大家呃介绍，也呃开场。我们是不是就先呃？大家鼓掌欢迎马前总统。Uh, Professor Hatton and distinguished guests,、uh, my, my friends, it's quite a pleasure for me to、uh, come back and talk in a law college I have taught for 18 years, 1981 to 1998. Uh, it's a quite a unique task for me to recommend the 18th edition, now 22nd edition, of Professor Marias Pervitin's、uh, popular college textbook, Book of Black, International Law, which I read the first Chinese edition in 2021. I met Professor Hedekin around 2003 in Taipei through Professor Su Yongqing of this law school. When I was mayor of Taipei City, and taught a course in international law here, as an international lawyer myself, I first studied international law as early as, early as 1970 or 53 years ago, when I was a third-year law student at National Taiwan University. I later went to New York University Law School and Harvard Law School to get an LLM and SJD in. 1976 and 1981, respectively. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the law of the sea. When I was asked in 2021 to read the Chinese translation of Professor Pettigrew's book, that I found so challenging that I finished reading the 551-page book in only a few days. I also found it challenging to translate. The German term "ho hai skaba," high power in Chinese, 统治高权 in,、uh, into English or Chinese. This is the first time I realized the existence of the two German states in Germany from 1949 to 1990 did present interesting challenges to the application of international law and the legality to have two states. In one country, as the German lawyers used to say, "Hi Deutschland, zwei Staaten, one Germany, two states."、Uh, obviously, the existence of the German reality makes the study of international law more complicated and more interesting as well. Given the similar reality of China, including mainland China and Taiwan, the situation is even more. Complicated because neither side across the Taiwan Strait recognized the German concept of two states, Staaten, in one German country. In Germany, the signing of the Basis of Relations Agreement, Grundlage Vertrag, 两德基础关系条约 in 1972, which was lacking in the context of mainland China and Taiwan, with the 1992 consensus. Namely, 九二共识 when China respective interpretations as the closest substitute on the issue of sovereignty. On the other hand, mainland China and Taiwan signed 23 agreements during 2009 to 2015, covering almost all walks of life of the people without anything similar to Grundlage and Veta, which was reserved for the 1992 consensus. In the Chinese and Taiwanese context, since 1987, I have been involved in formulating cross-strait policy 
of the Republic of China, ROC, dealing with opening the two-way family business, Tanqing. And 1987, the three links, Shantong policy in 1988 to 1991, which allowed postal trade and transportation relations, Tongyo, Tongshan, Tonghang, with mainland China, as well as the 1992 consensus of this, which means one China respective interpretations between the two sides. These new policies have served as well as the political foundation of cross-strait relations for 20 years, from 1987 to 2007. Besides, the two sides of the Taiwan Strait each set up an intermediary agency authorized by law to carry out the day-to-day -day work between Taipei and Beijing. The Taiwan side agency is called Foundation for Cross-Strait Exchange, Haixia Jiao Liu Qi Jin Hui, Jianzheng Hai Ji Hui, and the mainland is called Association for Relations Across the Taiwan Strait, Haixia Liang An Guan Xi Xie Hui, Jianzheng Hai Xie Hui. During my presidency from 2008 to 2016, I adopted the grand strategy of no unification, no independence, and no use of force. Meaning Taiwan not to have unification with mainland China now. The, and the declaration, no declaration of Taiwan independence forever, and no use of force between Taiwan and mainland China forever. The two sides also signed 23 agreements with mainland China during that eight years of my presidency, covering nearly all walks of life. On November 7, 2015, Mr. Xi Jinping, General Secretary and President of mainland China, and I met in a summit meeting in Singapore. We reaffirmed the 1992 consensus and the peaceful settlement of dispute between the two sides. The summit meeting successfully made the first face-to-face -face meeting between heads of, head of states of two sides successfully after a departure of 66 years since 1949. Uh, attracting more than 600 journalists globally to Singapore as witnesses. At the time, the Economist magazine notes that this summit meeting was the most significant concession mainland China had ever made on the issue of Taiwan sovereignty since the 1980s. During my eight years as president, I vigorously promote cross-strait peace and friendship. The number of mainland students, the number of mainland students, college students in Taiwan increased 50 times from 800 to over 42,000. Similarly, the number of Taiwan college students studying in mainland China also increased from a few hundred and grew to 40 times to 12,000 during the same period. With more than 1 million Taiwanese are now living or doing business in Chinese mainland, the number of annual cross-strait travelers reached 5 million each year. And the accumulated investment of Taiwan business in mainland China reached 200 billion US dollars. The total bilateral trade amount was 320 billion, with Taiwan having 157 billion of a trade surplus. This period was indeed a golden time between Taiwan and Chinese mainland in the last 70 years since the ROC government moved its capital from Nanjing to Taipei in 1949. Legally, the current cross-strait relations are based on mutual non-recognition of sovereignty and mutual non-denial of governing authority. The concepts I initiated and has been frequently used in the last three decades. By the time I stepped down as president in 2016, the succeeding DPP government decided to refrain from dialoguing with many China. As far as I know, the DPP government has dropped contacting Chinese statement for ideological reasons. This is not a sensible move, for the two sides were almost at war with each other several times.
In a word, what we discuss here now is an effort to apply international law to the relations between the two German states and, and less likely, to men in China and Taiwan. This is unprecedented in human history, but the purpose of this effort is to find solutions to problems of law and facts in a very special context. <clears throat> and the ultimate goal of this uh, effort is eternal peace and prosperity across Taiwan Strait. It is simply impossible to summarize the cross-strait relations as I did before, uh, as I did above. Much more discussions are needed to, to thoroughly analyze the complicated relations between Taiwan and mainland China. I certainly welcome your questions and comments on what I said above. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Hedigan. 他是中文的大学的国际法与公法中心的主任他的专长是宪法就是他的高祖辩护人与被告间秘密自由沟通权的保障是不是违宪的这个案子呃 client attorney privilege 也就是律师跟当事人之间的自由沟通的权利以及德国行政诉法在成为台湾让台湾成为亚洲第一个产生重大影响的一个极佳的例证
，各位在入口的时候可以看到，呃，这本书，呃，我当然不是书商，也不是来这边推销书的，但是这本书《w o r k e r e t w o r k e r e t 呃，国际法，呃，已经是原来是用德文写成，那经过陈金辉教授、李东颖教授、贺颖新教授还有李琼四位老师，呃，合起来呃翻译。由新学林出版这本书，呃，我作为一个国际法的学生，有机会拜读，认为这是一本非常好的教科书。它在德国风行版次无数，是德国最呃常用的教科书。这本教科书简单明了，但是非常好的一个地方是，它把国际法中。重要的文件，也包括欧盟法里头重要的文件，都用非常简单的方式在这里有所交代，所以它是极好的国际法基础读物。各位同学，如果需要一本啊、呃、言简意赅却又可以提纲挈领的教科书的话，这是一个非常好的选择。所以站在国际法提倡国际法的角度，呃，我觉得有理由。为各位介绍这一本书，跟各位介绍今天呃到现场，呃为 Professor h e r d i g a n 担任现场翻译的张凯志教授，东吴大学的张凯志教授，他的专场也是国际公法，呃谢我们谢谢他。今天 Professor h e r d i g a n 的讲题是 The New Dynamics of International Law。国际法的最新动态。那我们现在是不是以热烈掌声欢迎 Professor h e r d i g a n 为我们做呃演讲<笑> ？President Ma, thank you very much for the generosity of your words, if I may say so. Our relationship, our exchange of views, which now goes back to more than 20 years, means a lot to me. And I may add that you, as a distinguished international lawyer, and I even have a common pupil, a, co a common student, Professor Chen, who is now teaching for about, uh, has been teaching for about two and a half years now at Chenji University, yeah? which is another common bond, if I may add so, Professor Ma. Mr. Lee, thank you very much for your most uh, kind introduction and for recalling to all of us how important the interplay between constitutional standards on one side and international standards uh, on the other has become in the area of the protection of the rule of law and of fundamental rights, and I consider our cooperation in this landmark case as a very uh, interesting avenue for opening further cooperation. President Ma, Mr. Lee, dear Dean Emmanuel Xu, ladies and gentlemen, I take pleasure in sharing a few ideas about what we call the new dynamics of international law. 各位贵宾啊，那个 Professor Herding 感谢感谢马总统，那李所长啊，陈教授以及各位与会的贵宾。那今天非常呃高兴，今有这个机会到政治大学进行演讲。那 Herding 教授跟马总统的呃渊源实际上是大概二十年年前就已经认识。那他认为这是一个非常重要而且意义深远的一个联系。那今天希望透过呃这个简报，可以跟大家分享哦，在这个现在的国际社会中哦，保呃对于法治哦，以及现在关于国际法新动态的一些新发展。So I invite you to start by having a look at the established principles of international law, and we shall see how each of them reflects a new dynamic, be it for better or for worse. We have the old standing principle of sovereign equality, but at the same time, we see a new stage of great power politics in the world. 
which has, has not only reached the traditional great powers, but also infects middle powers, for example, like Turkey. We have the principle of territorial integrity of states and the prohibition of the use of force, a fundamental principle which guarantees the territorial existence of each and every state, which has been shattered and shaken to the found by the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. We have as another cause of the stone the responsibility of the UN Security Council for international peace and security under the UN Charter. And we see again in the case of the Russian invasion how this system is shaken if the very aggressor comes from the world directory as one of the permanent members of the Security Council with a right to veto. Then we have the right to individual and collective self-defense, which raises very complicated questions for the possibility to assist the attacked state uh, in, under the established rules of neutrality. We have just come to clarify the rules of neutrality and redefine them in context of the support of the Western alliance to Ukraine. We have the principle of non-intervention, which is defined very differently uh, among the uh, great uh, powers. We have elementary human rights, which are essentially recognized on a global level, but as to the understanding of the substance of these elementary human rights, there is still controversy in discussion, whilst we see that especially in Europe, these human rights are further developed and expanded even at the periphery. We can even see that a lot of, of political areas are driven by an extensive interpretation of human rights. But this is an observation that is essentially confined to the European context and doesn't apply to the global context. We have international humanitarian law with the absolute pro uh, prohibition of attacking civilians, which has come under stress again uh, in the Russian invasion. And finally, we have relatively new issues, which are old issues. Uh, but they have received a new dynamics in international law. I'm talking about the protection of the environment uh, under customary law, under treaty, and of course we have a, a, a particular dynamics with respect to climate protection. I will come back to this point later on. Oh, now, 国际法现在已经被确立的基础原则来作为今天呃演讲的一个主轴。那第一个关于谈到呃主权平等的关系呃概念，虽然这是一个已经在国际法上被普遍承认的一个概念，但在近代以来哦，包括在俄乌战争以来哦，强权跟政治的影响性哦，已经事实上对于这个所谓的主权平等概念产生冲击。那除了强权之外，包括土耳其等等的所谓的中等势力国家，它实际上在。国际法的世界里，其实也展现了不同的影响力。其次，呃，关于在俄乌战争中，其实我们可以看到，呃，不管是关于所谓的领土主权完整，或者是所谓禁止使用武力，甚至关于联合国，呃，对于呃维护世界呃国际和平跟秩序，呃，以及他在联合国宪章下的义务，其实都受到了挑战。特别是当呃呃涉及的对象是联合国安全理事会的常任理事国且具有否决权的时候，呃，联合国以及各该国际组织的运作实际上也陷入了相当的挑战。其次，呃，关于呃个别以及所谓集体防卫的部分，在此次俄乌战争其实也可以看到，那特别是在西方世界，针对这次俄乌冲突所展现的回应，实际上可以看出，呃，实际上呃在呃防卫权的行使上。各国展现了协助的一个义务，特别是对于中立概念哦，已经有所转变。另外，不干涉原则也可以看到强权对于这个概念的不同解释。
。至于在人权法的部分哦，虽然人权法已经上是呃算是一个普遍被接受的一个概念，但其实各国还是有存有对非常多的内涵，还是有不同的概念。特别是虽然在人呃欧洲的部分对人权有一些特别的见解哦，甚至有一些非常呃进步的一些思想。但它的区域性以及它受到政治性的影响还是存在，而没有办法完全获得在呃在全球获得承认。那武装冲突的部分哦，在人道法的部分不攻呃不攻击平民，其实已经获得普遍的承认。但包括在此次俄乌冲突里面，如何让它获得落实，也是一个必须被注意的问题。最后，在新呃发展的领域，特别是国际呃气候变迁等等的环境法保护部分，也是我们需要注意的面向。Now, if you look at all these principles that sustain the basis of the international order in normative terms, you might ask yourselves, what does sustain this rule-based order? And in my view, there are essentially two pillars. One is a sense of legal obligation. Which, of course, prevails under the rule of law in a domestic concept. Uh, no one is asking himself or herself why he or she is observing domestic law. It is just there. So laws have been adopted in a parliamentary uh, democratic procedure, and they are to be observed. And all of you and all of us have a sense of legal obligation. In the international community, you must have an additional factor, because we see that geopolitical, geostrategic, economic interests sometimes pull in one direction or in the other, and that's why political thinkers like Henry Kissinger say you must have a second pillar in addition to legitimacy and a sense of obligation. And that is balance of power. Now that is a concept that goes back to political thinking in the early 19th century in in Europe. After the defeat of Napoleon, we must construe an international system where we have a balance of power, and we see that the normative basis. Of the international order comes under stress whenever important actors try to shift the balance of power. Now that is an attempt to blend reality and normativity, and I wonder uh, what is your view uh, uh, on this conception? Whether you, uh, as representatives of the young generation, Consider this expectation still as satisfactory or not? 好，那个教授有提到，另外就是关于国际法的规范基础，哦，实际上跟国内法的概念实际上有一定的差距。在国内法，我们一般来说会认为，哦，规范的义务存在，可能是透过一个合法性，哦，包括立法等等措施通过后，我们会自然而然的认为，哦，所谓的呃立法的正当性存在，我们就有遵循的义务。而在国际政治或在国际法的世界里面，实际上这样的概念，除了所谓的遵循的概念还不足够。哦，如季新吉所说的，实际上在国际法的世界里面，呃，关于权力的平衡 （balance of power） 实际上也有展现非常大的一个影响力。特别在强权，呃，对于呃既有规范希望提出调整或松动的时候，其实也可以看出，呃，在法尊跟呃法律遵循概念以及在强权之间的平衡之间所展现出的问题。那教授也提出哦，希望大家可以思考哦，你们是否同意在法治的概念下哦，也可以容许这样对于权力平衡的概念的引入。Now, having talked about the customary, the universal principles, I turn to treaty arrangements in different areas. We have quite a number of human rights treaties, and President Ma just recalled how. Uh, paramount human rights treaties have been incorporated into the domestic order of Taiwan. That's a contribution to what I call sense of obligation, conformity between the international order and the domestic order. We have a, a very active uh, uh, judicial uh, system, uh, especially in Europe, the European Court of Human Rights. 
and to some extent also the American system with the inter-American uh, system of human rights, which assumed to some extent a kind of quasi-constitutional functions. To some extent they uh, operate as quasi-constitutional court enlarging and adding to the fundamental rights recognized under the domestic constitution. We have agreements like NATO, uh, the only surviving de de defense agreement uh, which we have. We have the OECE, we have the Council of Europe. We have global trade uh, agreements, especially the world trade system. Uh, and we have regional trade agreements. And I would encourage you to dedicate part of your attention during your studies to these economic treaties. They sound very technical, and they are technical. But they also coordinate different and divergent regular uh, philosophies. And they are also meant to discipline political strife. Uh, and uh, uh, many trade conflicts are expressions of geopolitical conflicts. So in order to understand the world as we see it nowadays, from a normative angle, you as students of law can no longer bypass these regimes on international trade law, on investment law, and on other economic systems. It was very different when I was a student. Uh, hardly, there were very few law professors who knew a lot about the GATT and these economic uh, uh, arrangements. But now uh, uh, you um, um, can expect uh, that young students familiarize uh, themselves with these uh, agreements. And, and Taiwan is a member of the World Trade Organization, and Taiwan is taking an active part also in, 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 in recent uh, controversies. Uh, suffices this to recall the controversy uh, um, uh, uh, triggered by the United States government decision to restrain the exportation of sophisticated semiconductors. Uh, uh, and it, it, it's also very important to see how regional trade uh, agreements are not only driven by economic interests, they are driven by very often common values a common uh, understanding uh, about what uh, uh, links and unites the member states. Uh, I do think, in my view, and you will have your own opinion, but that the agreement on the progressive uh, uh, partner uh, uh, trade and, and, and uh, uh, trans-Pacific partnership, the CTTPP, uh, will have a crucial impact on uh, uh, the political economic relations in the whole specific area. And I, as I understand this, there is some discussion, some consideration, whether or not Taiwan should strive to join this new pact on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You will know that the United Kingdom has decided to join that even Switzerland, uh, with all its nice mountains and lakes, and important banks, and important chemical industry, uh, is about to join. Then we have RECIP, which is a kind of counter design with the People's Republic as a member, the Asian member plus. Uh, a number of, of other countries like uh, 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 China and Australia. Then we have the North American Free Trade Area, which is now called the USMCA. And we have bilateral agreements like the one between the European Union uh, with Canada or with Japan. Uh, the agreement between the European Union and Japan has great geopolitical uh, uh, implications. Uh, if you look at the great trading blocks, you can imagine that an agreement on trade and investment 
between the, Europe, the whole European Union and its member states on one hand, and Japan uh, has a, a, a considerable relevance. Likewise, the agreement between the European Union and Canada, the so-called CETA. And again, it's not just trade, it's investment, it is other issues. It's a consensus about certain parameters of the rule of law. When we define in CETA and other treatments, uh, what are the standards which an uh, investor can, can expect fair and equitable treatment. That's nothing more and nothing less than spelling out certain parameters of the rule of law. So again, I would like to invite you uh, in your studies not to neglect these new branches, these apparently technical br uh, 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 branches of international law. And we see also the political implications. The great German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, uh, once made an interesting statement on that, but I will now stop for the translation. Chiso 特别是在这些虽然过去可能被认为相对来说是可能技术性的贸易或者投资协定在过去的国际法领域可能被认为相对技术性而不是那么普遍的被接受但应该特别注意的是这些所谓经济性协议实际上在某程度非常展现了各国
uh, among international relations. And you may uh, have read uh, uh, Copton saying in the 19th century, free trade is God's own diplomacy, uh, because it is the best instrument to ensure peace among the partners. 教授在这段特别提到，在康德的呃的理论中，他其实有提过关于呃贸易，贸易的精神实际上可以促成和平的发展。那在现在非常多国际法学者及国际政治学者里面，哦，特别在自由主义的概念下，其实都是同意这样的。但在跟这个呃有一点是相对抗的一个概念，实际上会认或更保守的见解会认为，哦，虽然贸易是可以促成合作，但实际上也取决于。呃，参与者必须共同对于这样的合作是有所谓的正面态度，也就是看是否可以透过这样的合作而取得双赢。因此，对于这样的合作到底能否达成呃最终的所谓的和平，其实会有不同的见解。哦，但不论如何，教授其实认为哦，国际秩序稳定哦，贸易特别哦可以在中间扮演非常重要的角色。Thank you. Now I turn to the new structures of rule making. In the old days, we had customary law, which was created by the practice of states and a corresponding sense of legal obligation, and treaties, and treaties were just applied as the partners understood them. Now uh, uh, we see uh, new developments where the principle of consent is eroded by judicial activism and the activism of treaty bodies, where treaty bodies in the regional human rights tribunal give treaties on human rights and other issues a new meaning, saying, well, the treaty has been concluded in the 50s, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. We must now adapt the treaty uh, by way of interpretation. Yeah? And that means that consent is no longer as important as it used to be. Then we have, uh, inst but this is essentially confined to the uh, uh, to uh, to human rights, and we'll come later on to a few other examples. Uh, it doesn't uh, apply that much to uh, trade law. Then we have mechanisms of soft law. These are rules which are not strictly binding, but which uh, express a kind of common understanding how states should behave. We have it in the area of climate change. We have it in the area of the corporate social responsibility of multinational enterprises, as we say in Europe, or transnational corporations, as you may, may, might say in, in Taiwan and in the United States. We have soft law in other areas like migration and refugees. Oh. 那关于在国际法的呃规范制定上，其实也出现新的不同的呃发展。好，在过去国际法的规范发展非常强调国家的一个同意，就是 principle of consent。但呃，特别是不不论是透过条约的缔结或者习惯哦，国家的时间去做。但在近来哦，所谓的司法激进主义哦，透过呃呃国际司法机构透过对于条约的解释，并在条约的解释中赋予条约可能过去在五六十年前制定的时候所未想象的一个新内涵，实际上也促成了呃国家呃国际法的一个新发展。但因为这些国呃国际司法。机构对于条约的解释可能未必与过往呃条约缔结时相吻合，所以这样的概念其实也导致所谓国家同意的一个基本原则受到侵蚀。但特别呃教授也讲到、呃，其实这样的概念在人权法领域是相对比较容易观察，但在贸易领域相对其实并没有那么显著。另外关于在软法的部分的发展，其实有讲到这个部分其实主要是针对。呃，虽然它并不是一个所谓强行或非常强制呃有效可以拘束国家的一个规范，但它其实反映的是我们对于国家所谓行为的共同期待啊、呃、或者一个想象啊。那在具体方面，可能包括了气候变迁，呃，关于企呃企业的社会责任，甚至移民跟难民呃领域都有这样的观察。Thank you. And we see also dynamics in the formation of customary law.、Uh, in the old days. We looked for the establishment and determination of customary law, what states did. And we asked ourselves, is there a universal or quasi-universal practice among states reflecting a corresponding obligation? Though we asked ourselves, what 
do states do? Which postures do they adopt? But here you have a, an interesting example where the court says, well, we interfere the in existence of customary law by what states do not do. Yeah. And the court held in the case Colombia and Nicaragua, I'm to some extent familiar with because uh, uh, at a given stage I, I participated as, as, as counsel before the International Court of Justice, saying, well, under customary law, no state cl can claim a, a, a platform, a continental platform, that extends to the exclusive economic zone of another state. And the reason, according to the court, is up to now, hardly any state has raised this claim. It says, well, we don't find examples. Uh, states do not raise this claim. And this abstention from doing something for us is indication of a universal or quasi-universal uh, state practice supporting a rule of customary law. That is not just actions, but also emissions, not doing something, not raising a claim, might uh, support the emergence of a rule of customary law. Tokuliang 国家没有做什么呃I now turn very briefly to human rights, which provide many examples of this, what I called traditional activism, where a regional human rights court gave the human rights treaties, the European Convention on Human Rights, the American Convention on Human Rights, a meaning which was not exactly anticipated when states uh, ratified the convention. Uh, examples are, for example, the case law of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on same-sex marriages. Yeah? So 50 years, 60 years ago, uh, uh, states didn't really think about uh, 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 this. We have uh, 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 similar developments in the European Court of Human Rights, and this is just an example to corroborate that uh, sometimes our human rights courts act as a kind of quasi-constitutional courts. These are issues really dealt with by a constitutional court. Should parliament recognize the right of parents to have in vitro fertilization? Now, our constitution 70 years ago, 50 years ago, didn't really uh, uh, consider that issue, Are we, uh, nor did our, uh, our human rights treaties. Yeah? And, 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 and still you have uh, uh, judgments, uh, for example, from the American courts. Yes, this convention gives parents a right to have recourse to in vitro fertilization. That's a very controversial issue in, in many states for political, ideological, religious uh, reasons. Though you see, they act a, a bit in a way like a, a constitutional court restraining political options. But again, uh, this is essentially confined to regional human rights treaties. We wouldn't see the same dynamics in other areas. 那在特别在人权领域的时候
过去在缔结相关人权条约的时候所想象的一个内涵跟保障。那这样的呃，这样的对于呃。呃，国际区域法院对相关条约的呃解释，实际上也让各国、呃、在对于思考这些相当多关于政治跟宗教都具有相当敏感性的议题的时候，各国对在政治上选择呃处理方式的选项也相对受限。呃，但也要注意，这个其实多数的发展也局限于所谓的人权领域，特别是区域的人权领域的发展。And we can also see this trend on domestic level. Where national courts blend constitutional uh, uh, rules with an extensive in dynamic interpretation of, 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 of treaties or of soft law. A famous case is the German uh, uh, Federal uh, Constitutional Courts uh, Judgment of 21. We discussed about this uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, uh, th where our Constitutional Court held that under our constitution, in light of the Paris Agreement on, on climate protection, uh, parliament must be more ambitious in fixing uh, the uh, limits on carbon emissions, yeah? also in the interest of intergenerational uh, uh, justice. So it blends the German basic law with the Paris Agreement and uh, uh, the uh, statements of the World Climate Council to say you must do more right now and cannot shift the burden of uh, 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 severely uh, restraining the emissions to future generations. We have the uh, ruling of the Hague District Court in the, K in the Royal Dutch Shell case where it held that the oil company Shell uh, uh, it was still called Royal Dutch Shell because at the time it was still based in uh, the Netherlands and in the UK, must reduce its carbon emissions by 40%. Yeah. And this on the basis of an interpretation of the Dutch civil law and international standards, not based on a Dutch Act of Parliament. Oh, in the, uh各国的国内法实际上，我们也可以看到，国内法院在国际法适用上，呃，所产生的交织影响力，呃，特别是呃，举例来说，在德国，呃，以及在荷兰，实际上我们都可以看到，在气候变迁议题上，呃，国内法院哦，在呃，透过国内法的解释，将国际法义务哦，课予在呃，课予给不论是公司或者是国家，那特别是要求呃，国家有义务在现呃，在。采取相对即刻的呃手段来解决问题，而非把它留给呃未来的世代来处理。那在荷兰和、呃、荷兰的案件里面，特别提到呃透过呃荷兰国内法的解释跟适用，实际上也转换了国际对环境法的义务，然后促成减排的措施的达成。Another area where we find this new dynamics. In context with international soft law is the corporate social responsibility. These are the parameters which determine how a responsible international multinational uh, corporation should behave with respect to human rights, with respect to environmental protection, with respect to labor uh, rights, uh, with respect to climate change. And we have uh, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the Rocky principles. These are just recommendations. They are not binding, but they inspire uh, 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 the positions taken by state, and they inspire legislation, especially in, in Europe. We have the guidelines of the OECD for multilateral enterprises, and we have the UN Global Compact. None of these instruments are binding, but they inspire legislation and they uh, uh, inspire judicial rulings. And the Dutch court in the Shell case relied a lot on the UN guiding principles. And by blending the soft law with hard civil law, under the Dutch uh, uh, civil code, it transformed the soft law into hard law. And uh, the core element uh, 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 is the due diligence that in the supply chain, 
uh, uh, our enterprises must observe due diligence. They must inquire and control and verify whether or not in the supply chain you have textiles, etc., woven by children, for example. Whether we have forced labor and so on, or corruption, uh, or uh, 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 excessive contamination of the environment, which is something uh, uh, feasible and to be realized by the big corporation, uh, but which is a, a great issue for small and, and medium-sized businesses who sometimes do not even know uh, 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 details about the supply chain. Again, this is an issue which is paramount, especially in Europe, much less in the United States, and even less in the rest of the world. Uh Uh,人权甚至环境保护具有所谓的忠实义务。那在这样的具体落实，实际上可以透过呃整个供应链而形成，呃，或者是具获得落实。举例来说，可能企业会要求它的下游厂商必须对于。Thank you. I now briefly talk about tectonic shifts. We have seen that the international order, as a rule-based order, rests on two pillars. One is a sense of legal obligation, and the other one is a non-normative, uh, a kind of, of, uh, of, of foundation, the balance of power. And uh, uh, new great power attitudes uh, try to change the existing uh, balance of power. And in the end, that leads to a two-tier society with at least two or more classes. There are the great powers, the middle powers, and the small powers. Yeah. And you just have to listen to the uh, official pronouncements by some of these states saying, well, there are small states and big states, and we are a big state. Yeah. And we have a, a pronouncement by the Chinese and the Russian go uh, 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 government that say, we, the big, the great powers, must take the lead. Yeah. And all this conduces to what we might call a renaissance of political realism. Uh, uh, Morgenthau, in the 50s, that's uh, the, uh, a, a classical book, uh, uh, Politics Among Nations. It was first published by a German immigrant, Morgenthau, in the 50s, and has been published m more often than my textbook, <laughs> I think tr 30 times. He wrote in the late 50s, was the sentence reappeared and reappeared up to the present day. The aspiration of power is the distinguishing element of international politics. If I had told this to my students eight years ago, they would have thought Professor Herding is just an antediluvian old school a hardliner, conservative. Yeah. No, no, law, harmony, cooperation is the governing law. Yeah. We all have common values. Yeah. Everybody wants peace. Everybody wants to protect human rights. Everybody wants to fight global warming. That's been the, uh, the, the perspective of the young generation 
10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, there was peace, yeah, at least in Europe. Yeah. There was food, there was education, yeah, and there was security granted by the United States. Yeah. So we didn't have, have to worry about this. Yeah. But now, if I tell it now to my students, they find this very adequate to describe modern times, the aspiration uh, um, of power. Yeah? And you will find almost the same sentence in Trump's security doctrine of 2017. Yeah? Uh, now, under the Biden uh, administration, you have a, 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 a somehow different wording, yeah? but you will find the world's competition, rivalry, stabilizing the existing balance of power. So that's a softened version of a realist approach even prevailing among the present US administration. Yeah. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people would have said, oh, that's like George uh, Bush's son. Yeah. That's old fashioned. Uh, these are the dinosaurs. Only dinosaurs conceptualize international relations in terms of a power game. That's the end of this. Uh, that's a Cold War. Yeah. But now we realize, and uh, all of us are to some extent shocked by this perception, that that is reality. Not only far away in the globe, it has come home to the very core of Europe. And that is something which has sobered uh, our younger generation and our students, even in, in Europe. Yeah? So we just have to cross one country from Germany, Poland, and then we have war. Yeah? That's something we had last time that was a generation of our grandfathers and, and grandmothers, or great-grandfathers. And then we have BRICS. Uh, you will recall the last meeting of the BRICS countries uh, in, in South Africa, trying to change the power game, the balance of power, to set up a, a competing model to the Western alliance, even talking about a, uh, a common currency. Yeah? They've established also some kind of monetary fund. Yeah? Uh, but we shall see that uh, uh, these aspirations by the BRICS country will, in the long run, be defeated by reality. Oh,那个教授另外也提到，在呃除了前述关于法院的呃改变之外，实际上在国际规范的呃也产生所谓的结构性的改变，特别是呃在前年提到哦，在呃国际规范的秩序建构上，除了所谓的法律遵循的概念
if uh, someone 10 or 15 years ago would have asked me, what do you consider the greatest challenge for the world order? I would have said without hesitation, Iran. Yeah? But now we see it is just one of many uh, uh, conflicts in, 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 in the world. Ukraine, you are aware of, uh, 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 of, of issues uh, uh, which are very intriguing. Uh, we have the Iran deal still pending. We do not know uh, how we shall proceed with the nuclear potential of Iran. We have the issues about the South China Sea. We have the Strait of Hormuz. We have the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. We have Syria, Libya. Some of these conflicts were uh, 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 triggered by the action of, of Western states like, 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 uh, like Libya. And we see the conflicts between international stability and human rights. We had Colonel Gaddafi, which was a totalitarian regime oppressing uh, uh, his people. But from an international perspective, uh, it was a stable regime. Now, now we have brought this regime down, but we have chaos in, 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 in Libya, and we see very often that we have fundamental aspirations, fundamental values which conflict with each other. That is something which is also very disconcerting for a young generation which used to bath and to, uh, in the idea of a worldwide harmony. There are just conflicts. There are conflicts between uh, uh, de development and climate change. There are conflicts between territorial stability and, 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 and democracy within a, 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 a regime and so on and so forth, and we are seeing, uh, in the case of the uh, 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 Russian invasion, uh, a total blockade of the Security Council. Which brings me to the next issue after the translation. Uh 他对国内的人民具有压迫的状况Thank you. Now I will just sum up this chapter on the Russian war of aggression, which acts like a kind of prism on some issues of international law. The support for a party to the armed conflict and the laws of neutrality, the scope of legitimate sanctions, the power of the uh, UN General Assembly in light of the stalemate and the blockade of the uh, a, a security Council. And as we have seen, the problem arises from the aggressor being uh, a permanent member of the Security Council. And any permanent member of the Security Council can block and, 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 uh, the uh, Security Council by its veto powers. Now the question is, what can be done about this situation when the principal organ of the United uh, Nations is just blocked from taking any decision? And that is where the uh, 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 UN Generally uh, Assembly comes in. It falls back to a resolution adopted in the Korean War, where it said, well, if there's a blockade of the Security Council, we the General Assembly of the United Nations may take up this matter and make pronouncement recommendations how to act. And they came back to this in the case of the Russian war against Ukraine. And that brings me to the next slide, where they held, well, we declare that Russia must withdraw from Ukraine. This uh, must stop uh, 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 its armed operation. So 
the Security Council is, uh, uh, is blocked, is unable to act, and then that's where the General Assembly steps in and says, we uh, declare, we demand that Russia withdraws its troops and terminates its uh, occupation and puts an end to its military operations. That's uh, a new dynamic yeah? uh, now in favor of the powers of the General Assembly based on a resolution which was taken in the year 1950 during the Korean War. Oh, not see some the Uzongo, Turbis, Zai 借以使所謂的侵略者的行為或呼籲侵略者的行為應該停止或受到遏止 Thank you. And they have a new dynamics in international criminal law. You all of you have heard about the arrest warrant of the International Criminal Court brought against Putin. Now that really transforms custom international law uh, under which an acting head of state enjoys absolute immunity. Uh, there are some modifications to the parties to the Rome Statute of the International Court of Justice, but Russia is no party. Uh, so uh, uh, we can ask ourselves, how can it be that there's a spontaneous change on the rules of the immunity of an acting head of state? There's no state practice. There's no uh, uh, universal legal conception. Yeah. I think all of us may be to some extent receptive to an arrest warrant brought against Putin, but still under international law, the issue is intriguing. Uh, and in methodological terms, it's very difficult to explain why the International Criminal Court adopted, uh, could adopt an uh, uh, arrest warrant against uh, President Putin. And this goes on and forth in actual uh, uh, discussion uh, can we establish a new criminal court uh, 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 on the basis of an agreement between Ukraine and the United Nations? I personally see no reliable basis for this. But you see how far the dynamics are driving people, states, governments, and, uh, uh, and academics to reconsider and to reformulate established rules of international law. Oh. 另外一個在國際刑事法值得關注到的新動態那雖然可能目前多數的人對於這樣逮捕令合法可能保持是一個比較接受性的態度但這不妨礙這樣的一個逮捕令合法對既有國際規範所產生的一個影響那另外特別是現在其實在學界或者是食物界也有討論到是否
for uh, uh, political reasons. We had the cases on the, uh, uh, the conflict with Ch uh, 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 People's Republic of China on the exportation of various raw materials. The very first cases where we have restrictive measures uh, uh, relating to the exportation of material. Usually trade conflicts arise from restrictions on the importation. Yeah? But uh, 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 China wanted to control uh, the supply of raw materials, uh, 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 rare earth, etc., in favor of uh, her own industries. And uh, the dispute settlement body of the World Trade Organization says, now you can't do that. When you uh, restrict ex uh, exportation, you must do that in an even-handed manner that affects domestic industries in the same way as foreign industries. We have similar cases with Indonesia. We have uh, uh, now uh, uh, the conflict uh, uh, between the United States, China, and other countries on steel and aluminium products. That's an importation restriction. Yeah? And uh, uh, we have the pending case, uh, which is uh, very important, on the restriction of the exportation of certain semiconductor and other products, especially to, to China. Uh, that's, that's geopolitics. It's, it's, it's not so much a trade issue. Yeah. And all this is governed by Article 21 of the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which says, well, states may take steps to protect uh, its, uh, uh, their essential security interests uh, and, uh, taken in time of war or other emergency in, in, other, in international relations. And you may ask yourself, have we already reached the stage where there is an emergency in international relations between the United States and, and China? Uh, hopefully not. Yeah. But the question is, what is an emergency? And we see how this issue is governed by legal standards. Yeah. And uh, 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 dispute settlement body of the World Trade Organization, well, there must be really a serious uh, uh, actual conflict, not just a hypothetical uh, 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 conflict.呃相对应的行动态发展特别是呃在贸易上虽然过去可能强调技术性或者是比较偏向技术的规范实际上现在其实也可以看到它受到非常多地缘政治的影响以呃前面两个呃关于中国呃不论出原物料或者是基础元素
in maintaining the resilience of the normative foundations of the international order. Uh, we have seen, and it's, something, it's a lesson which our students, especially in Europe, have to learn, that the world is not just driven by the same values, not necessarily by our values, but there are other factors. The French president de Gaulle once said, well, there are no friendships among states. They are just common interests. Yeah? Uh, and I would add, there's a third dimension. We have seen values, interests, and relationships. When I asked my friends from Namibia and South Africa, why did you abstain when the UN General Assembly took uh, the vote on the resolution uh, on the Russian of, of war, the one uh, I, I, you've seen on the screen. They will not say that they are in favor of the Russian invasion. Yeah? It's neither common values nor common interest. Namibia or South Africa has no interest in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's relationship. The Russians helped us to fight uh, the colonial regime. Yeah. The Russians helped the uh, uh, Communist Party 40 years ago. Yeah. They have been our friends. How can we vote against our friends? Yeah. Only because they violated elementary rules of international law. So we see that possibly what the goal that must be corrected a little bit. There may be not friendships as in human relationships, but there may be the factor of long-standing, almost familiar relationships that some kinds feel, well, we belong to the same family. And that's why we cannot vote against another family member in the United uh, Nations, although we do not approve of what the other family member did. And that's one explanation which sounds very strange to our students, may possibly sound strange to you, but it reflects the reality in some parts of the globe. Still, I do think uh, that we uh, have to fight for a core of universal values. We will not always have the very same uh, conception of certain values. But I do think that we should fi fight for uh, the core, the common core of universal values. And that's why I'm so curious uh, to listen to your interventions and your questions. And uh, President Ma and Do uh, 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 Dr. Liu have been so kind as to refer to this book. And I'm very proud of the uh, Chinese edition which uh, is the effort of my friends here in, in Taiwan, because I understand it as a little stone in the path, in the way for a further and constant dialogue with all of you. Thank you much indeed for your attention.那关于未来的展望实际上教授其实也在重复了提到 那在处理国际议题或观察国际议题的时候，呃，虽然可能会因为 
没有对俄罗斯实施谴责，这不不代表他们实际上同意哦、呃、同意俄罗斯的行为，而是在于一定的程度，他认为他们既有的关系，特别在解殖民过程中，俄罗斯所提供他们的呃帮助，呃，让他们不愿意在这样的场合里面呃对进行谴责，哦、呃，因此弃权。那。最后，呃，在普世价值的部分，教授提到，呃，价值可能是一个会改变的一个概念，可是应该要注意到的是，价值可能，呃，个别会不同，但还是应该尽量的寻求共同的价值。那，呃，教授最后也提到他的国际法的书籍，哦、呃，那也就在此不再赘述，谢谢。呃，感谢呃 ，Professor Hardy， 也感谢张凯志教授的精彩发言。